Hello, sir. I'm Uzzab Kazi from Hindustan Times, a reporter. Uh, so you spoke about uh, the importance of competition, the need for competition, uh, so as to enhance the quality of universities. Uh, but there is a question that is, uh, uh, I mean, which concerns the third world countries like India, and that is about the reach and the equity part. So how do you balance uh, like the competition and the tuition fees? Because uh, uh, like uh, many students, in fact, most of the students don't really, uh, they can't really afford the high tuition fees. And you spoke about financial aid, uh, but we are talking about financial aid to like 60 or 70 percent of students. So how do we do that? Thank you. I think you need to find formulas where people pay for their educations out of their subsequent earnings. One model that's been tried in Australia, it's been tried to some extent in the United States, is a model where students are asked for each bit of tuition to pay a certain percentage of their earnings after they graduate for the first 10 years or for the first 20 years. And I think so-called income-based repayment offers enormous promise. I also think that more traditional lending arrangements have substantial benefit. I think it is very difficult once one recognizes that in any country, and certainly it would be true in India, that the students who have a chance to attend university disproportionately come from relatively high income families and the students who graduate from universities disproportionately will be in a relatively high part of the income distribution. To ask the population as a whole to pay to keep tuition down seems to me to be odd in its egalitarian implications. And so I think one does need to think very hard about models that place the burden, uh, the financial burden, for higher education on those families that either in a prior sense or in a subsequent sense are its beneficiaries. Yes. Sir, I'm uh, Rajendra Shah. Um, how, how has America succeeded in keeping a culture of excellence and not being equated with elitism or snobbery? Because quite often in India, we Politically, quite often, uh, uh, excellence gets equated with elitism and snobbery. The fact that Donald Trump is doing as well as he is in the American primary elections suggests that we do not have problems of pop, the, suggests that it would be a mistake to think that the United States does not have problems of populism and of revolt against uh, elites. So I don't want to claim that this is a problem we've completely solved uh, in uh, the United States. I think we do it in several ways. One is our so-called elite institutions go to enormous effort to recruit students from everywhere and particularly from the most disadvantaged kinds of backgrounds. And we are very open to recognizing that students who've had weaker preparation because of their background may be just as able as students who've had stronger preparation, even if they don't do as well on our entrance exams. And so we look at applicants in a holistic way, rather than simply looking at applicants as, uh, test, uh, as test scores. I think another part of it is that we have this idea of competition and everybody wants their school to be better. And if you can keep score, and if you can measure, we, uh, I think it helps. 
you know, there are these magazines that do rankings of the American universities. And the people who run the American universities all hate them. But they all want to be at the top. Anyway, and they all complain about the rankings, but they're all focused on doing whatever's necessary to get their school upwards on uh, those rankings. And so I think the sense of competition for excellence um, is something that helps to reduce the impulse. I mean, imagine a sports team where there wasn't winning or losing. It would probably put all the players on the field more and the best players on the field less. But because there's winning and losing, it sort of puts pressure to put the best players on the field. And I think something like that contributes to helping us pursue, uh, uh, to pursue excellence without it being, because it's regarded as winning and winning isn't regarded as snobbish. Whereas if it was just excellence as an abstraction, it's easier to see as snobbish. Yes. Here, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Vinaya Deshpande from the Sunday Guardian. Uh, sir, I want to know what is your assessment as an economist, apart from uh, having good universities, in fact, focusing on great universities, what are the other things that India should focus on to have a high rate of development consistently? Economy beyond universities. You know, in some ways, I think that what I talked about um, with respect to universities is a microcosm of some parts of what India needs. Towards the end of my remarks, I tried to make a little joke about how you would approach um, having international education, and was it a commit? Was it a planning committee to establish a framework committee to establish an implementation committee, or was it just doing it? Well, I think that kind of idea applies in a large number of spheres. You know, um, I was uh, privileged to employ Sheryl Sandberg before she went on to work at um, uh, Facebook. Cheryl Sandberg worked as uh, my chief of staff at the Treasury. And she had an attitude which has now become a slogan at Facebook. It's up on the walls. Done is better than perfect. And I think if your government internalized that a bit, and we just had an idea that decisions had to be made, and we hoped they'd be made right, but they just had to be made. And there was a substantial acceleration in decision making in every sphere. I think that would make a very big, uh, a very big difference um, for, in, uh, for India over time. I guess the other thing um, that one's struck by is uh, the need for a variety of kinds of infrastructure improvement uh, in, uh, in India as well. But I think in general, faster decision making, a presumption of permission rather than a presumption of prohibition um, would go a long way. Yes. Wait, I was trying to wait, wait, I'm sorry, I was trying to call on the woman in the green dress back there. She doesn't yeah. have a mic, I think, yet. Then I'll call on you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, no, 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 no. I'm gonna call on her and then I'm gonna call on you. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Lata Mohandas, I'm a homemaker. And uh, my question to you, well, you, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that India was a place where you, uh, a, a student uh, who studied abroad or, or had a good education would get a very good amount of uh, return on his investment. Um, but my point is, you know, most new age entrepreneurs are not really looking at return on investment. What they're looking at is, is issues like global warming, climate change. Uh, for example, Elon Musk in his presentation in Paris last week said that uh, uh, 
uh, that you know he wouldn't be making a seventy-five thousand dollar car if it, uh, if it if it you know if it reduced carbon emissions. That is his goal. So point again here is that if people are if uh, new age entrepreneurs are looking at sorry okay so so what would be the opportunities here in India for that sort of investment in business? Could you repeat your question again? Oh, the last bit. For him. Somebody up here hear it? Did you hear it? I heard parts of it. Yeah. Tell me what the essence of it was. <laughs> I think I'll let her tell you that. Yeah. Okay. My question, in short, would be new age entrepreneurs are looking not only at investment, at the return on investment in their education, but they're also looking at making a global impact in terms of improvement of uh, quality of human life and what would be those opportunities that they would be looking at in India. So she, she says that she's asking you a question about what are the opportunities for making an impact uh, and not just looking at it from point of view of return on investment. So she's talking about issues like climate change and things like that. So if young people in India were looking to make an impact. Look, let me say first that I think if you start a company and your company employs thousands of people and those thousands of people are able to support their families because your company employs them and you produce a product that is valued by a million customers as adding something to their life so they're prepared to spend a portion of their income on it. That you have done something valuable and important. And I think it is a serious mistake to denigrate mere commercial success and to denigrate earning a return on investment. That is a large part of what drives the world forward. Now that said, I think there are all sorts of areas, whether it is clean energy or entrepreneurial aspects of information technology, helping three-year-olds learn uh, to read, or whether it is providing medical technologies to enable people to diagnose themselves and to get the treatments uh, they need, whether it is improved uh, transportation technologies. I think there are many, many spheres in which there are both profit opportunities and opportunities to meet basic social needs. But I don't want to accept the idea that simply making successful and valuable investments and earning a return on them is somehow not a hugely important thing to do. Yeah. Um, I had two questions. One is, you spoke of the ed tech space and the flipped classroom model. And I wanted to know what, according to you, is the reason for the low completion rates in the MOOCs? Low completion rates in MOOCs. She wanted to know if you had some thoughts on why. Low completion, oh. You spoke of the success of the ed tech space and the flipped classroom model. Then why are the MOOCs having such low completion rates? Yeah. Look, I think the, the question is why do uh, MOOCs have such low completion rates? I think part of, the, part of the reason is that it requires very, very low commitment to enter. If I start college, then I have decided to commit a portion of my life to being in college. I or my parents have written a check to cover the expense of uh, college. And so I don't make that decision lightly. On the other hand, if I decide to take a MOOC, I get on the web and I sign up my name and give my email address. And so, since there's no commitment at the beginning, it figures there's going to be no commitment. It figures that there's going to be a much lower carry through rate. So, I don't necessarily think that uh, there's, um, that there, you know, there's low. 
um, that it necessarily means there's a problem. I mean, in a way, taking a MOOC is going on a date with a class, and going to university is getting engaged to a is in getting engaged to your education. And so it sort of figures that one is going to have a higher carry through rate uh, than uh, the other. And I think over time, by asking people to pay more for MOOCs, by doing more screening before people can sign up for certain kinds of MOOCs, I suspect there'll be more success in sorting out the people who are committed from uh, the people who are dilettantes. Yes. Your volume is not on, please. Good evening, Professor. My name is Abhiji. I represent an international institute of sports management. My question is that one of the challenges that we have in India in the education sector is that of quality teachers. Be that of quality teachers, be it primary, secondary, or higher education. What would you suggest us to develop as strategies, good teachers, and more number of good teachers? Look, there are two kinds of ways of answering that question. One way of answering is you need to adjust the training program in this and such way in order to train people to be better teachers. Another is pay people who teach better more than you pay people who teach worse. And don't let people who teach really badly keep their jobs as teachers. If you do that, the problem will solve itself. And uh, it fundamentally is a matter of incentives and rewards. And if you provide for rewards for teaching well and penalties for teaching badly, you will tend to see the quality of teaching uh, improve. Very good, sir. Summers. Uh, I am Aishwarya, a student from a, a college affiliated to the Mumbai University. I had this question as an undergraduate student that I believe that the economy or economic stability of a particular place would be of concern while I choose a university to study. So how do you think that sitting back here in Mumbai, I can judge that parameter? In the context of online education? No, no, no. Huh? If I wish to study abroad, if I wish to judge the economic stability of that place in order, you know, to choose a better university, how do you think I can judge that being back here in Mumbai? Okay. She'd like to choose to study abroad and she'd like to know how to go about doing it. Uh, if, you get on here in the, if you get on the website of the Institute for International Education, I think you'll find a variety of American institutions with a variety of study abroad, a variety of options. You know, how the financing is going to be handled and so forth would depend upon particular cases and it would depend upon what field, uh, what fields you were interested in studying and what your background was. But there are websites that would help you navigate your way to institutions in the United States or institutions in Australia or the United Kingdom. Thank Let me you. take one more, one more question. Yes. yes. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Praveen from Nano Science Center, assistant professor. Uh, I have uh, one small question. Like uh, in university community, we have always two different groups. One is very excited to do something, and another group is like critics or having a fear. So how students student get confused because of these two kind of partitions, so they cannot choose a proper way. So my question is how someone can overcome this debate and get to more excellence through this confusion? You get no, me? I didn't, uh, no, say that again, please. I didn't Yeah, get see, that. actually, uh, in, uh, in view of students, if you see, there are two different perceptions. You know, one is excitement to do something better. And second perception is like fear or critics. Fear. 
and I'm through sorry. that, how we can find the excellence. So he says that students um, are excited to do things, but there's also a lot of fear among them about succeeding. So how does one reconcile this and achieve something? You know, I think usually positive incentives are better than negative incentives. And so usually it's better to point to opportunities and models for success than to emphasize uh, than to emphasize uh, negative consequences. Beyond that, I'm not sure how to answer your question in the abstract. It would uh, depend upon uh, particular consequences. And look, I, let me say this as a final thing. I did not mean by trying to draw some lessons to make any of this seem like it was easy or uncomplicated. Um, I think all of this is very challenging and very complicated, but I think it's useful always to have a North Star. And the North Star I would suggest for India is five institutions in the top 100 a generation from uh, now, a gross enrollment rate of above a third um, a generation from uh, now, a substantially higher completion rate for those who enter college than exists now, a much greater economic and background diversity than exists now for those who attend Indian uh, colleges. A program that would let one learn English, calculus, Indian history, and a set of other fundamental subjects on a mobile phone that worked at the college level, that worked in every village in India, that was available 15 years uh, from, uh, from now. The existence of a high quality, private, universal university that stood as a challenge and a base mark and a benchmark for what was going to always be a fundamentally public institution. These uh, higher education in India, these seem to me to be aspirations and benchmarks for a plan that if successfully implemented, and you can think of benchmarks on other dimensions like clusters of technological excellence and 15,000 American students in India in 2030 uh, studying in America in uh, studying in India in uh, in 2030 I think a, a vision of what constitutes a generate constitutes success half a generation to a full generation from now is very helpful as something that would drive uh, an effort forward. And if you repeat a vision often enough, and political leaders repeat a vision often enough, sometimes it just has a way of uh, happening. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity to be with you.